Hi guys, welcome to the JFK uh, lecture video about uh, President John F. Kennedy's president? presidency. All right, here we go. So he's going to get elected in 1960. But before we start, let's talk about objectives. Understand how television impacted the election of 1960 and the future of politics. And then understand the long-term effects of Kennedy's domestic policies. Our essential question, what was the purpose of Kennedy's new frontier? All right. And so John F. Kennedy, he is a Democrat. All right. He is, out of, he is a senator from Massachusetts. He comes from the Kennedy family. They're kind of like a royal family in America. They're kind of a big deal. Um, so he's a senator from Massachusetts. Uh, he gets the Democratic Party's nomination in 1960 to run for president. His, he promised to get America moving again. All right, we hit a recession. He wants to get a move on America moving again. Uh, he is well organized on his campaign. He's a very handsome, charismatic man, which a lot of studies actually show that we base our who we choose to be president sometimes on looks. Not strictly on looks, but if you're good looking, it probably helps out. All right, let's meet his opponent, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon is the Republican nominee for President of the United States. Uh, he is Dwight Eisenhower's vice president. All right, so Vi uh, Dwight Eisenhower, a lot of Americans really liked Ike, okay? And so it's kind of like Richard Nixon floating in on his coattails. But however, Kennedy is going to beat him, and two things help him out, TV and civil rights, okay? In the beginning of the 60s, you know, the civil rights movement is starting to gain momentum, and uh, Kennedy is a pro-civil rights person. Also, the TV, by 1960, 90% of households have TVs in America. And so when they see him on TV, this is going to help. I'll get to more of that. So Nixon and... Kennedy on September 26, 1960, they hold the first televised presidential debate. Okay, um, if you take a look at the two gentlemen down here, you have Kennedy on the left, Richard Nixon on the right. A lot of people talked about how Kennedy, if you even look in the pictures, Kennedy looks calm, cool, collected, while Richard Nixon, on the other hand, a lot of people said he looked tired or angry, um, worn out. Okay, he didn't look as healthy. Uh, Kennedy spoke better than Nixon, okay? People made the comment, he just, he acted and spoke and looked presidential, okay? And that brings it to, like, how you how you appear helps you get elected when it comes to the presidency. Um, if, you're, if you're better spoken, okay, um, you have a better way of words. If you are cool, you're calm, you don't get frustrated when during these debates, and you seem presidential, you seem like somebody who can lead. All right, they said that Kennedy did a great job and Nixon Nixon didn't look as good as Kennedy. All right. Um so so as I said, the television becomes central to people's lives, okay? And a lot of observers blame Nixon's loss because of his poor appearance during the presidential debates that were on TV. JFK looked cool, collected, presidential. You'll hear that a lot if you watch the presidential debates. Um they always say this person looked presidential. All right, this is your electoral map, so you can see that uh, Nixon won the West, a few of the Midwest, uh, all right, but Kennedy, Kennedy won the South and the East Coast, and that's where all the big numbers are. I mean, in some Midwest as well, you have uh, Illinois with 27, Texas with 24, Michigan with 20 electoral votes, uh, New York with 45, Pennsylvania with 32, okay, so he gets all these Southern states that really helped tally up the the numbers. All right, you can see here, uh, Kennedy got 303 electoral votes, takes 270 to win, um, while Nixon got 219, and the third party candidate, Byrd, got 15. Out of the popular vote, all right, this was super close election, all right, out of the popular vote, Kennedy had, uh, 119,000 votes more than Nixon. That is really, really close. Okay, um, and as I said, Nixon dominated the West, but Kennedy won the South and the East in those big number electoral states. All right, uh, as we know, we talked about this during the Cold War, the, the Bay of Pigs and Cuban Missile Crisis. When Kennedy comes into office, 
he inherits the plan of the invasion of C Cuba with the Bay of Pigs from the Eisenhower administration. So from the president that was there before, he inherits this plan. Well, of course, we know he does it, fails. It turns in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but that's another video lecture of mine. Right? They called the years in which Kennedy was in office the Camelot years because the Kennedys were considered like American royalty. We don't have like a king and queen, but the, the Kennedys were kind of considered that. They were, uh, if you take a look at the picture, him and his wife, they're young, good-looking people. They come from a high prestigious family, okay? Um, they are also known for inviting artists and celebrities to the White House, okay? The press really loved the Kennedys. The Kennedys had this charm about them, this, this marriage that was very loving. The two young kids, they kind of just depicted this ideal American family, okay? And so people really hang on to this. They really like the Kennedy's uh, appearance, but he also does some wonderful things while president as well. All right, so let's take a look at his, his vision of America is called the new frontier. Okay, so um, that's his, in, his, initi or his initiation, initiatives and vision are for the new frontier. What he wants to do is get the economy back running. He wants to improve education. Okay, the Soviets are leading in the space race, so let's catch up, put some money in the science and math and the space. All right, he wants to establish medical care for the elderly and the poor. And uh, he also wants to do space exploration. So at his inauguration in 19... Uh, 61, he actually says, by the end of the decade, we will put a man on the moon. And in 1969, we will do that. I have more on that later. One of his programs is the Peace Corps. All right, what the Peace Corps is, is a volunteer program um, in which American volunteers go into developing nations in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And they, they go to these towns. They stay with the people within the town. They help them set up... Uh, and establish things within the community. They could be building homes, they could be help building schools, they could be running lessons in the schools. Um, all sorts of different projects that these uh, developing nations have. And when I talk developing nations, I'm talking um, nations that haven't industrialized. They're not quite where America is. Um, there's a lot of poverty, okay? They can't really do much for themselves. So we come in and we help them out. It's a total volunteer program, except for, you know, the government funds this program. So they're going to send you to these different nations for free. Um, but you have to help these people out. And then when you're done, you don't get any pay for it. But they're going to put you up, make sure that you get fed and you have a place to stay. Um, if you want to travel the world for free, it's a pretty good idea. Okay, so that's one of the things he does. Uh, the Peace Corps is still around today. So if you're an independent person maybe looking to see the world, um, this might be something you might be interested in, especially if you like helping people. That should be your main priority, helping people. All right, it's a huge success, uh, still around today. All right, we start a race to the moon with the Soviets. All right, in April of 61, the Soviet cosmonaut um, is the first man in space, okay? Then the Soviets are also going to put the first man to orbit the Earth, orbit around the Earth in space. All right, so the Soviets beat us with the satellite, first person in space, first person to orbit the space. We're behind in the space race. We're losing. The only thing we can beat them at is put a man on the moon. In July of 1969, the United States is going to put Neil Armstrong, first astronaut, first man to walk on the moon. And in fact, we did it with less technology than what is in your cell phone. That is crazy. Like you have more technology in your cell phone than our spaceships and our landing crafts did, but we put a man on the moon with that. Not only that, we had it cameras. It was broadcast all over the TVs. Um, people sat in their homes and watched this as this man took the first steps on the moon. And this would just be uh, one of the first few times we're going to go up to the moon. All right, so this is Neil Armstrong here, July 20th, 1969. He takes a step off. He says, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, and kind of like floats through the air. All right, so everybody was kind of excited as like, wow, man, like what does this mean? Are we going to start like living on the moon? Can we put like lasers on the moon? Can we put nukes on the moon? Maybe take care of the Soviets? Okay, um, so we beat the Soviets to the moon. There's a lot of controversy about whether the first moon landing happened or not. I'm not going to get into that. We can talk about that in class. 
So the economy, by 1960, the United States hit a recession. We had 6% unemployment. Uh, the economy starting to go down in the 50s. Remember, it was like blo booming pretty good. Uh, cost of living doubled. People were buying houses. Okay, um, so what JFK is going to push for is deficit spending to stimulate growth. The idea of deficit spending is where we spend more than we make. So we're going to go in the debt. But the idea is if we put this money out there for the people, the people are going to have more money. They buy things. That creates a demand. Creating demand creates jobs to keep up with the demand. And that gives people jobs who get more money in the process repeats itself. He also spends 20 or he increases the spending on defense or uh, military by 20%. Remember, we're in the Cold War with the Soviet Union, so um, we're going to be competing in this arms race, and eventually, remember from the Cold War unit, we bankrupt them by spending so much on military. They have to spend more to keep up with us than what we have to spend. And he's also going to put money in for unemployment problems just to help those without a job to get money and to continue on, okay? All right, tragedy in Dallas, All right? Uh, November 22nd, 1963, he's going to get off Air Force One, the presidential plane, and land in Dallas, Texas. All right, he's going to have a luncheon with the with the governor, Governor Conley of Texas. All right, he takes, as you can see in the picture, an open air limousine. This will be the last time a president ever rides in an open air limousine. You can see he's unprotected on all sides. He does have secret service men in the car behind him, in front of him. He's got police on motorcycles on the side. Um, but there's a different plan that day for other people. And so he's driving through uh, Dallas. He's waving at the people, okay, as most presidents do. You visit with the people when you're in, in that area. Um, so he comes around. You can see right here by the county criminal courts building. And then he takes a left down this. This right here is the Texas School Book Depository. Up in the sixth floor on the right side of the building, on the front side, is a man by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald. All right, Oswald has a bolt-action rifle up there, and he is going to take three shots at the president. And, and it's three very quick shots. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, uh, the only man to ever capture, capture it on video is a brooder. He is standing right here. This is also known as the grassy knoll, but I don't have time for conspiracy theories. We'll do that in class. All right, so this is what it actually looks like. He comes down this street, hangs a left here, and Oswald is hanging out in that video, or in that window right there. If you go there today, this is the window, Oswald. This is the window here from a distance. This is where he is. They keep a piece of paper there to show you where Oswald was hanging out. All right. So he's in the sixth floor. This is the grassy knoll here. I'll cover these pictures in uh, class. All right. So what ends up happening is three shots go off. The first one misses. The second one enters JFK. The back of JFK's neck comes out the front of the neck and then hits Governor Conley in the back. The bullet kind of actually like travels down his stomach and comes out one of his legs or into his leg. Um. All right. So the president is, and then the second, sh the third shot actually hits President Kennedy in the head and kills him. Okay, um, people saw this. All right, there was a man missing that worked there. His name is Lee Harvey Oswald. He's accused of the crime. He goes on the run. He ends up getting pulled over by a cop, shoots, kills the cop. But eventually we catch uh, Oswald. Then while Oswald is in police custody, they bring him out of the police station to transfer him somewhere else. And Jack Ruby, a man known with uh mafia ties he's got cancer he's got six months to live he has communist ties he actually runs up and shoots lee harvey oswald in the stomach that shot actually kills oswald we don't actually find out why oswald did this um and jack ruby said he did it because of patriotic feelings some people suspect the mafia was behind this the kennedys did have mafia ties um and then, you know, shortly after, Jack Ruby dies of cancer. So a lot of un, unanswered questions are left to as the tragedy behind the assassination of our president, John F. Kennedy. Um, and then you see over here, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson is on Air Force One. He is sworn in as the next president of the United States with President Kennedy's wife standing right next to him.
All right. We'll talk more about the assassination and what all exactly went on in class. This ends our video lecture. Thank you for listening.